Hey guys, today I'll be interviewing um, the author of The Dynamic Power of uh, the Southern Shaolin Kung Fu, uh, Ron Willer. How are you doing, Ron Willer? I'm doing good. How's everybody going? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to ask a few questions, and I got very interested in the uh, Zhao Ga system. Could you introduce uh, yourself to the audience, please, of who you are? Yeah, my name is uh, Ron Wheeler. Uh, I've been studying martial arts since 1977. I started when I was 12 years old. I started in the Zhao Ga system under my late Sifu. He just passed away um, earlier this year, like, under Dean Chen in his school. Uh, later in 81 and uh, then with the system pretty much ever since. I did, I dabbled in a couple other things. I did some Hong Kong for a little bit, dabbled in the uh, Ching Tong Long Seven Star Frame Mantis for a bit uh, under Glenn Tapscott, who came from Chulun up in New York, or the late, late Seafood Chulun in New York. Um, and, but I've pretty much been doing Jaga ever since. I mean, you know, yeah, 37, 37 years doing one thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to um, ask you for the audience, what is Jaga? Um, uh, what is actually Jaga? Like, what's the combination? Because there's so many uh, martial arts. I used to take uh, Hung Fat system. You, right. you know what it's Hung Fat, right? Correct. Right, right. It's a combination of Hung Gar and Fat Gar, but now I'm into uh, Wing Chun. But can you give a little bit like description? Um, to uh, what is Jaga? Sure. Uh, Jaga, the, the old name is uh, Hong Tao Choi Mei, which stands for uh, the translation is the head of Hong and tail of Choi. Some people will say uh, a longer name, which was uh, Hong Tao Choi Mei Bak Siu which covers all three styles that make up the Jaga. So Jaga is a combination of the Hong Ga, which is its base, uh, then the Choi Ga, and then the, uh, the Northern Shaolin. Uh, Zhao Long, the founder or the main founder, was he and his four other brothers originally did the Hong Ga from their uncle, uh, Zhao Hong Hei, who was a student of uh, Wong Kei Ying, the father of Wong Fei Hong. So our Hong Ga comes from Wong Kei Ying, not, not, uh, not his son, Wong Fei Hong. And then he learned the Choi Ga uh, from a did uh, the Northern Shaolin in the Kedloxi uh, Temple in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and then combined all that into what you have known, to what we now know as Chao Ga. It was renamed uh, Chao Ga uh, after he died in uh, 1919. Okay, you know, I noticed um, a similarity between uh, Hung Fat and Chao Ga. Is there a similarity to that? Yeah, well, we, um, yeah, ahead, yeah, we share a common system with the Hong, the Hong style. You know, with the isotonic movement. So anytime you, you know, have I think Zhao Ga and, and the Hong Fat, um, no, the top would be Zhao Ga Hong Ga system like uh, Fu Jiao Pai. Anything that has any type of isotonic movement where you're pushing, it's like you're pushing against the wall. You know, and the arms are are vibrating. You're doing more Hei Gong or hard Qi Gong. Um, at the uh, the punches that we have in, in the Zhao Ga as opposed to the Hong Fat. Uh, Hong Fat punches are definitely more straighter and more linear based on the Hong Ga system because that's its base. And then you add the Fat Ga or the Buddha palm to soften things up and smooth it out a little bit. Um, where we come in is, as far as the difference. So we have the straight and the circular. So the same punches you would see in Choi Fat, like Sao uh, Choi, Pao Choi, Cup Choi, Biu Zhong or Bean Cup. Uh, we share those same punches. We share the same exact punches as Choi Fat and and uh, um, and the Choi Ga. Oh, okay, okay. Um, did I ask you when do you learn Jaga and what make you learn Jaga? Um, I started doing Jaga um, again back in '81, but originally I wanted to do it earlier. Um, um, detective shows like I Spy and the Avengers and the Saint, they were always doing martial arts. They had movies like, you know, with uh, the late um, uh, Robert Coburn, uh, Man Like Flint, In Like Flint, and of course watching the original Star Trek with William Shatner, you know, or what we call Shaq Fu. Where, you know, he'd jump across the table and fly inside, kick somebody or chop somebody across the neck. You know, I was always interested in that. And then of course, 
the old Kung Fu TV series with the late David Carradine. Once I saw that, I wanted to do Kung Fu. But at that time, um, you know, in my elementary all the way through high school, I went to Catholic school all my life. And, you know, my parents were like, you know, I told them, I want to do Kung Fu. I want to do Kung Fu. And they said, okay, let's let's weigh this out. Catholic school, Kung Fu, all, all, all thoughts of doing Kung Fu. And what happened was Chinatown in D.C. at that time was really kind of a rough place to, to hang out. She wasn't going to let her, her teenage, her preteen son go to Chinatown and hang out. So what happened was I was doing, I was learning Taekwondo at the time in my neighborhood in the uh, Adams Morgan section of the city in Washington, D.C. And Randy uh, had a class in the same building that we were in, but a space above us. So one day after my class, I went up to his class, not knowing what they were teaching. I just heard these sounds. And I looked, and they were teaching Jiao Ga. And at that time, uh, you have to remember, Jiao Ga is the oldest Kung Fu system in D.C., Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia, and I think Delaware and Pennsylvania that taught authentic Kung Fu. Um, and the school was very popular. So everybody wanted to know a few people that learned Jiao Ga back in 74, 75, 76. They don't practice anymore, but if they, you know, have done martial arts and they found this, oh, just, oh, oh yeah, I did Jiao Ga with in Dean Chen school. It's, it's amazing how many people I've just bumped into, you know, on the subway, on the bus, you know, you know that have done Jiao Ga. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, okay, thank you so much. What what are the principle or philosophy of Jiao Ga? Um, the philosophy is on the, of the Jiao Ga is, is in the poem. Um, I, I, I would have a hard time trying to say it in Cantonese, but it's basically um, in two couplets. And, you know, couplets run, they're the, the principles that govern the, whatever system you, you practice. Um, and the one couplet says, one half of the poem is basically uh, to leverage your opponent's energy uh, to your perspective. So that's that's pretty much the philosophy of Jiao Ga. Um, you know, not to, it shouldn't be uh, two bulls just ramming each other. Um, again, use your opponent's strength against them, is basically. Let your opponent do the work for you. And then always expect the unexpected. Like, just because you got him down doesn't mean he's out. You know, or just because you hit him just cause doesn't mean he's going to drop. You know. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, uh, can you give us tips when practicing Jiao Ga? Yeah, I mean, the main thing is uh, foundation. A lot of a lot of people, um, it's it's different. It's different when I came out. I came up. Anybody that's my age or older, you know, uh, especially my age, we came up under what I call learned uh, that have been teaching. Let's say. Um, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, we came up under there, uh, under under those guys, um, people like Ma Sifu, um, Wei Hong uh, in New York, or Wong Tak Fei, uh, the teachers Charlie Fett in San Francisco, people like that. We came up under those guys. So um, we went through the heavy stance training. We went through you know, head punching um, over and over and over again and learning one form at a time, not you know, I pay my money to you, I learn this form, and then I, I learn the next one. No, it was, you're here to learn, and if you don't meet the criteria to move on to the next thing, then you're just stuck here. So, you know, and you, you, it's too hard to teach like that now. It's very difficult to run, and run a commercial way of learning. So any tips for Jaga? Foundation, 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 foundation. Um, when I was in Hong Kong back in 2009, I met with, uh, the then uh, chairman of the Jiao Biu Athletic Association. And he was a second generation Jiao Gong practitioner. His father had learned from Jiao Biu. And so he had actually seen Jiao Biu as a, as a small child himself during the course of his life. But he said Jiao Biu always stressed foundation, foundation, foundation. That's that's because that's what's going to benefit you later on down the road. Yeah. Okay. All right. Foundation. So basically, everything that we have to do is uh, start always from the basic, right? Um, but uh, let me see. I'm trying to think of a way. Uh, okay. Why did you uh, create um, your book? Well, the first book. Uh, what happened was um, I started working the first book, which was the Power of Shaolin Kung Fu. Uh, I started working on that back in 
2001. Mm-hmm. And then I sort of shelved it because I was like, ah, you know, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know. And then what happened was I made the um, the U.S. team in 2004 and went to the first World Traditional Wushu Festival and Championships in Shenzhou, China. My mother had just died um, in March of 20, in March of 2004, and that was the last thing she and I discussed was me trying out for the team because I told her I said, "Look, I'm 39. I'm not sure, you know, how much." you know, longer my body's gonna be able to do this. I wanna try it one more time to go to China. And she thought it was a good idea. And then she passed away, unfortunately. But um, so after she passed, after I made the team uh, and represent, I was the only Jiao Gao person uh, on the team um, and won double gold in both my events. I met two guys, um, Casey and Perry, that were from the Hong Kong team that also did Jiao Gao and knew Chen Man Chung. So they knew my Sigong. They referred to him as Sipa, uh, which is older uncle. And so, unfortunately, they spoke English. So uh, I got lucky there. And so they went back and got back to Hong Kong and told uh, Chen Min Chung all about me, that they had met me, that I had won these divisions and such and such and this, that, the other. And so I decided, you know, I'm going to go ahead and do the book. I'm going to go ahead and do the book. And, but I needed to get permission. So I asked um, through my seeing uh, Lee Han, I asked him, you know, what do I do? He said, do a letter. I did the letter in English and Chinese. Send it to Chen Man Chong. He contacts Han here in the States. Han calls me on a Sunday morning and tells me uh, that Chen Man Chong has given me permission to do the book based on my performance in China. So I had carte blanche. Uh, the photos um, in the first book that you see, you see a photo of him in the front and then a photo of him, two photos of him when I talk about him in the book. He sent those personally. He shipped, he sent those over here because he wanted those photos in the book. I, I didn't use all of them. I'm actually going to use some in the next, in the third book I'm working on now. But um, oh, you're working on the third book. What's it called? I mean, I was going to um, uh, get the uh, second book, the new book that just came out, right? With the DVD. Right. That, no, that's the first book. Oh, that's the first book. That's the okay. first. You have, you have the second. Oh, I have the second. Okay. So the third book, well, what's the, the third book called? So the third book we haven't got I haven't gotten a title working title yet, but the third book will have four sets. It'll have the uh, double headed staff or certain type mm-hmm. one. Uh, it'll have one of our other advanced forms, uh, Fu Pao Ken and Tiger Cougar. It'll have the uh, double broadsword uh, set, which is or double sabers, which is the Sub G Muay Fao Sundo, and then a set I created or put together for a student of mine um, to improve their footwork called Seal Sub G Kernel or Small Cross Pattern Fist. So that, that'll have four sets in it. Does Zhao Ga have any like drunken boxing form? I, I'm just curious because uh, I remember uh, back then um, uh, I was learning how fun and they had like just a word on like drunk boxing. And also drunken boxing was one of my favorite for, uh, you know, Chaggy Chan. You, you, you watched the uh, drunken boxing with Chaggy Chan, right? And yes. Yeah. Um, Zhao Ga, we, of the original sets, uh, there is a drunken, there's one of the branches that teaches a drunken boxing set. Uh, I believe it's a branch out of Singapore. It could be Hong Kong, but originally there was no drunken set in the system. The original, the, the original base of the system, as far as the forms, there was no drunken set. Uh, okay. Um, I, I read in your book, you like tiger claw or tiger. Why? Like what, what's, what's the symbol behind it? Well, yeah, I grew up, I grew up, you know, like I said, I came up in the 80s. So, you know, we, we were, we were at the, uh, we had a theater here in D.C. down in, on, on, in uh, Southwest uh, at LaFont Plaza called the American Theater, um, which was one of the theaters owned by Shaw Brothers. So I, I watched Shaw Brothers movies left and right back then. I still have a, a massive collection now uh, of DVD, Shaw Brothers DVDs. As a matter of fact, I was just at the uh, Urban Action Showcase yesterday in New York, um, and it was given at the AMC Theater on 42nd Street, and I got a chance to meet uh, Lou Fighting from Five Deadly Venoms. So that, that was pretty cool. That was pretty cool. He looks And he looks great. He looks great. So to, to your listeners out there, Lou Fang was in movies like uh, Kid with the Golden Arm, Five deadly, he plays the centipede in Five Deadly Venoms. Um, it's been a long, long time I watched that, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, you know, uh, he plays uh, 
Cal Chinchung and uh, two champions of Shaolin. So he's a, he was a classic staple in the Shaw Brothers. He played mostly villain characters. A couple times he played good guys, but mostly villain characters. Is, you know, he's really fun to watch on screen. I got a chance to meet him yesterday. But back to your question, as far as those maneuvers, you know, you have to remember the uh, the late director, Lao Kar Leung, was a Hong Kong stylist. And so he, there was always Hong Kong being demo, being displayed on screen. So you got a chance to see, you know, Tiger catches the lamb, single Tiger exits the cave, Tiger pushes the mountain, you know, things like that. Tiger rakes the sand. So you got to see all those techniques all the time. And so because Zhao Gao's, you know, most southern long range styles are Tiger call based, like the Hong Fat, Hong Ga, Chole Fat, Fat Ga, you know, things like that. Um, it got it showed you how to apply those techniques, and so I got so I, I kind of fell in love with tiger claw techniques. I mean, it's still my my you know my favorite technique to apply uh, when I'm free sparring stuff like that. So, but there's always a time and place to do it. Oh, uh, okay. Um, I you know um the hung foot system is very interesting. I'm I'm not comparing. It. It's just that do you guys have um. Because uh, basically, I believe that every system is really unique, so I'm not biased against anything. Um, I'm more a curious person. That's why I do the interview. But also, I think um, Chao Ga has uh, lots to offer to the world. And also, I would like, like, do they have animal system inside? Because uh, the Hung Fu system has the animal, like tiger, crane. Because I know that they have uh, the crane in there, right? Yeah. Now, the book, the book that you have, which is the second book, um, has the longest form in our system of all the old forms, which is a Dai Fa Fu Kim, Big Subduing Tiger Fist. So there are not a lot of claws in the form per se, but what it is is a representation of a tiger, of the endurance that you need to have. Tigers are, are, have great endurance. Um, small tiger, Seal Fa Fu Kim, which is small subduing tiger fist, which is in the first book that has a DVD. Um, that's basically representative of, of a, of a young tiger, like a, almost like a cub, full of energy, you know, moving, 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 moving. Um, Big Tiger is, uh, again, it's a, uh, it's about, um, it's basically a two-part form. It's uh, a chi building, chi releasing form. So the closest comparison to that would be, if you look at the Honga system, and you look at their first form that they, they normally teach, which is the Goji Fa Fu Kim. And that form is all this isotonic movement, all this tension. And then you do it on both sides. And then at the end, uh, and then once you finish all the tension, then you release the form and do all these techniques. And Big Tiger is akin to that. So there's where the Honga is influenced in that set. Um, it just, I mean, Big Tiger is a long set, man. I mean, and normally it takes, if you do it properly, it should take you anywhere between six to 10 minutes to do properly with the proper breathing. So it's about, again, having the endurance of a tiger. So um, then you have um, Fu Pao Kin, which is a combination of tiger and then leopard techniques. And we call it, we nicknamed it for us here in the States, we nicknamed it Big Tiger's Little Brother. It has the same, it has isotonic movement in the form, but not as much. So it's not as much, uh, not as much Qigong building so now you're not concentrating so much on energy. You're going back into building energy or improving it. But it's more akin to fighting. And it's about the strength of the tiger and the speed of the leopard. So, I mean, there's the leopard section, you're moving fast. And that's one of the traits of Zhao Ga is where no, one of the nicknames is the fast hands of Hong. And it's not an insult to the Hong Ga system. It's basically, if you were to um, continue... Uh, developing the Hongga system, then Zhao Ga is where it would go. It's basically like that. Because our techniques are, our hand techniques are faster and where Hongga basically is one, mo one movement, two movement, stop. Uh, and the Zhao Ga will do one step and do three movements, three hand techniques all in one time. So oh. that, that's the way the system is designed. Okay. Um, <clears throat> do you who, who did you look up as a uh, martial arts? Because a lot of, uh, for like, um, like Bruce Lee, most, a lot of people like Bruce Lee, the role model. Oh yeah, no, I love, I love Bruce. I love Bruce. But it's funny, I, I, I said, um, 
in in uh, in an article that I'd written back in the day um, for Kung Fu, uh, Kung Fu Tai Chi magazine. A lot of my a lot of the, the heroes I liked were again a lot of the stars from Shaw Brothers, Ocean Shores, Golden Harvest, things like that. So people like Lao Kao Leung, you know, uh, or, uh, and then uh, Liu Cha Wei, uh, which, or his English name is Gordon Liu. Uh, people like who I just met, Lu Fang, uh, you know, the Venom, the Venom, what they nicknamed the Venom Mob. Uh, people like that. Uh, Lo Mang, Lo Mang was I, I like Lo Mang, and Lo Mang is actually um, a very good. He's the first person to demo or display the the Chao Ga Tong Long, which is the Southern Man Chao family Southern Mantis on screen. So a lot of what you see him do, um, if you look at uh, like. Kid with the Golden Arm, or uh, Shaolin Rescuers. He demos a lot of Southern Mantis in there because that, that's his base system. I believe he's also learned Chole Fut. And I just found out um, from one of my singings earlier today who asked me how the event was in New York. He evidently did Chao Ga, but he still refers to it by its old name, which is the Hong Tao Choi Man. Ah, uh, OK. Uh, how can we master Chao Ga? And what can we do when we learn the form and how can we use it, the technique in the form in a fight or in sparring? Or how can we use it effectively? Well, I would always recommend, I mean, the books are the books are basically a guide. Um, and it's 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 to guide you along. Um, it gives you an insight into the system, but um, you really need to get to a, a, a good school. You really need to get to a good a good school and a good seafood and learn properly. But the books are there to guide you along. Um, it's also to help uh, preserve material. Um, one of the things um, the founder of uh, Chole Fut, Chen Hong, um, said was, people forget, so write it down. So that's why if you look at Chole Fut, like, uh, like Dr. Fei Wong Sifu, he has a lot of manuals on Chole Fut, a lot, from his teacher, La Ban, from Wong Gong, uh, from uh, the Kong Chao branch. So he has all these manuals because people forget. Now you can put it on video and or, or put it on DVD and record it because we're going to, we, we forget. And even even uh, my Sifu, uh, Sifu Chen said, you know, you, you know, it's okay if you forget the form because somebody can, can always reteach you the form, but the techniques you should never forget. You should always remember how to apply certain things. Um, as far as applying technique, um, my personal belief is that, um, I'll, I'll, I'll preface it with this, if you can make it look like the form and carry it off and defend yourself, not a problem do I have with you. My problem is people that try to make it look like the system because they want to make it look exactly like the system. Like it's got to be a bow and arrow stance. I've got to make this, hold this posture like this. And it doesn't work. And I'm like, well, it needs to be adjusted. <laughs> You know, you're dealing with, you're not dealing with, you're not on a muck jump, you're not hitting a heavy bag. You're dealing with a live person when you're, when you're dealing with a, combat, uh, uh, a fighting situation. And so you have to adjust to what's going on. Um, I think tournaments is an excellent way to find out what works and what doesn't work. Uh, and I'm, I'm a, you know, I, I competed for years and years and years. I fought, and even though you have rules and gloves and equipment, you need to adjust your system according to that and see what you can use from the system in the scope of what you're doing right then and there. Uh, too many people get, they say, well, I want to make it look like this. I'm like, I, I, I'm not arguing with you what you want to make it look like, but that is, that's not working. So why don't you make some adjustments so you can get the W, as we call it. And that, that, that's the thing I say, you know, uh, they want to do, you know, I don't know if you can see, they want to do a Jin Sao and they want to block and then do it exactly like the form. And it's like, you know, dude, he's got gloves on and it's a jab. That, that, why don't you just take this part? Just block. You know, take that part. You don't have to do all of it. Just take the parts that you need. And even Sifu, you know, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, before I got into school, my singings told me Sifu had gone back to Hong Kong uh, in the early 70s, like 74 or 5. And he came back and he had all you know, eight, you know, eight millimeter, you know, tapes, you know, the old, you know, real tapes. So he, he, um, 
came back with some footage of different fights, full contact matches, and they had gloves on. And my my seeing said uh, they were like, "See, well, how come they're not sitting in this stance and using this technique?" And he said, "You guys watch way too many movies." <laughs> you know, he said that's that's not the reality. He said that's not how this stuff works. He said, you know, you have to make adjustments, and and that and I believe in that. I believe in that, and that's why, you know, that's where people go wrong. You know, they try to do it exactly. I, I get it, you know. And again, if you can make it work like that, okay, God bless you. I got no problem with it whatsoever. Really, I don't. But when people say, you know, I sparred a guy, you know, I'm not going to mention the system he did, you know, because it's, it's a good system. And I sparred this guy because I work in UFC gyms. So I sparred this guy, and he's a little bit taller than me, and he wants to do it exactly like the system says. And I said, listen, your system is very well known. It's a good system. It's a northern style. I said, but man, you know, come on, we're in the ring and we got gloves on. Come on. You know, you want to do all this, you know, all this stuff. And, you know, I'm like, come on, man. You know, <laughs> you know, meanwhile, I'm, I'm bang, bang, bang. You know, there's no difference between a sal choy and a hook punch. There's no difference. We're talking about a circular punch on a horizontal plane. That's what we're talking about. Who cares if you're standing up on a board arrow stance? It's still a hook punch. You know, if you do uh, a pow choy, which is a long range uppercut, or not, what's what's the difference? The angle of attack is exactly the same. The way you position your hand is exactly the same. One's in a long stance, one's in a short stance. It's still an uppercut. You know, so, you know, and that's why in, the, in my first book I talk about, um, there's a chapter called Boxing the Missing Piece. A lot of people, you know, some people got upset. I'm like, listen, I'm I'm just being real, you know. You know, you guys want to make it look like the system. I'll, I'm trying to get the W, okay? And we're dealing with gloves, and we got rules and regulations and things we can't do, things we can't do. You need to work within those confines. Now, self-defense-wise, it's the same thing. People want to look like this. I'm like, you're trying to save your life. Don't don't screw around. Don't screw around. Keep it simple. Keep it direct, and go home. Right. How can like yeah? I, <clears throat> I totally hear what you're saying. Like I, I've seen it too many times. Like when we try to do like fixate on the the whole system, how can we, as a practitioner or as yourself, how can we adjust for like in a sparring or because it's hard sometimes when we um, believe in this system, but we want it to. I guess what I'm trying to say is. Um, how can we be flexible without being stubborn? You know, too many people are like you said, like um, like people, uh, the seafoods get angry. So how can we adjust that? Like Ch to fighting. Yeah, Chairman Chung, when he uh, had three visits to this country, he came in 74 before I got into the school. He came in 88, three years after Sifu had died, and he came in 91. Um, and his first, his second time, was the first time I met him. And I, I met him three times. I met him in 2009 when I w went. Um, he was in fair health. He wasn't in great health. He was in fair health. But the two times I met him, he was in good health. So in 88, I was 23. And I was an assistant instructor uh, under the Wong Chinese Boxing Association, under Raymond Wong. And I asked him, translated through his son. He's, he's had his two sons, Philip and Francis. Philip is the youngest. And I asked him, you know, what else did he ever learn anything else other than Zhao Gan? He told me no. And I'm thinking, come on, you're in Hong Kong. How could you not learn something else? You know, you got all these guys, all these famous teachers. And he said, no, Zhao Gan is all I've ever done. And he says, and he told me, Zhao Gan has whatever you want. It's up to you to pull it out. Now, and I, and I took that to heart. So I look into the system. So the, the, the the best part, I guess, is the second part of that question is how can you make adjustments? How can you be flexible? Don't look at, I tell my students, don't concentrate on how the technique looks, per se. Concentrate on the theories, the tactics, and strategies, and concepts of the technique. Don't worry about how it looks. Can you, what's going on with the technique? Can you, uh, can you adjust the technique accordingly? Can you use the theories uh, of, the, uh, in uh, of the technique in different ways? There's different applications. There's hundreds of hundreds of applications, and you're only limited by your imagination. So, um, so 
For instance, if, if you want, like in Java, we have what's called the, the scissors block. So if you look at the form, and it's, you'll see the big tiger in that book. We do a block like this, where, where it's a you know cutting block. It's designed to block a really tight kick, a heavy kick to the body. But that can also be applied as an arm bar. If someone grabs you by the wrist, you catch by the wrist and you turn and you you know take them down. You crack the elbow. Uh, it's, you know what I mean? The applic you know, the maneuver is the same. I'm applying it on an elbow or a joint instead of blocking a kick. You know, you know, I can tell you for me in sparring in the ring, I spar quite often. Um, because I work at UFC gym, so we got guys that box, do MMA. Um, I just had a uh, sparring session, you know, friendly sparring session with a guy that does savant, which is, you know, the art of French foot fighting or what they call old boot. I mean, that guy was fast. And he, he wasn't in great shape. And he totally admits it, but he'd been doing Sandal for 10 years in France and Sabat for eight years. And the Sabat made him quicker. And he was all over the place, man. And But having having that experience of being in the ring, I could handle it, you know? But he was really good. It's about, you know, I mean, I would, I would hate to see him in, in shape. If he's in shape, he'd kill somebody, <laughs> you know? So, you know, but again, um, you got to be flexible. You know, people say, well, I want to apply this technique. They say, okay, well, what, what are we doing with the technique? We're blocking and we're attacking the head, okay? So you got gloves on. Well, you can't call with gloves, so what do you do? You parry and punch. It's still a strike to the head, see what I mean? So the end result is the same. One's a claw, one's a punch, but they're both attacking the head. You got one with gloves off, this is with gloves on. No different. Okay. What is your own philosophy on Kung Fu and on life? Um, I'm, I'm sort of like, you know, when, when one, of the one of the problems I had, I'll answer this way. One of the problems I had sparring with, I, I, sometimes I would start too slow, um, but that was because uh, I wanted you to open up and attack. I'm still defensive oriented when I fight, when I spar. I can attack when I want to. I'm, I'm better now at attacking, like, you know, if I have to go after somebody. But normally, I'll let you go. I'll let you open up because I know that with your hands up, you know, and, you know, and I know you can just see my hands. So you can't hit me and stay in this position. You can't. Something's got to go. Left hand, right hand. Something's got to go. And so once you open up, now I got you. So now, if I want to open up, I'll try to lead with something else. I'll use something more of a, as a distraction, you know, or to see what, what type of reaction I get out of you. Um, if you just do a quick pair and you don't do anything else, then the next thing I'm throw, I'll throw the same technique, but then I'll throw something else right behind it. It may be a low technique because now I've got you focused one way. And I go another way. Um, so life, life is life is kind of like my philosophy on life. I, I guess would be kind of kind of like that because um, people um, they they you know people are funny. They 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 say they want certain things done, and but they don't want you to do them. And I'm like, okay, well then you do it. Oh, I don't I don't, don't want to do it. Okay, you don't want you don't want to do it, but you don't want me to do it. <laughs> you know? And that was one of the reasons I wrote the book because it had to get done. You know, we've been talking about a book for years and years and years, and no one's ever done it. When I was in Hong Kong in 09, and I met with the sons of uh Holat Man. Holat Man was uh Chen Man Chong Sihing in, in the Jiao Ga. They both learned on the Jiao Bill. Well, Holat Man has five sons, and they're known as the Ho brothers in Hong Kong. So when I met them, um one of the, you know, a couple of brothers speak really good English because, you know, Hong Kong was a British colony for 99 years. And so when I told him I was working on a book and I was just about to finish it, and he said, he told me, he said, thank you. Thank you so much. He said, we've been trying to do a book over here for years and we just can't get our act together because everybody wants their version of stuff in, you know. And so he said, I'm just glad to see it out. Um, I'm actually going to send a package over the first book. They actually have a copy of the second book that I mailed that I sent uh, over there about a year or so ago. Um, but, it, you know, you gotta, you just gotta do it, man. You gotta do it and um, just hope for the best. But as long as, you're, as long as you're doing what you know is the right thing, you, you know, you don't have anything to worry about. You can't, you know, and it's hard for us because we're 
um, as humans, we're emotional creatures. You know, we're emotional. You know, we don't want to be, nobody wants to get slammed. No one wants to get talked negatively about. We all want to be praised. But a lot of times the things you do, you know, it, you know, it, it just ain't going to garner that praise. And it's, it's as hard as it is for us to accept that truth. That's a very real truth. So you got to say to yourself, you know what? I know what I'm doing is right. I'm not breaking the law. I'm not causing problems. I'm not causing drama. You know, I, I tell people, look, I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do drugs. I don't run the street. I don't gamble. You know, nothing. You know, I do exactly what I'm supposed to do when I'm supposed to do it. So um, if, if if someone's upset, and a matter of fact, a guy who was a student yesterday I met of Chuck Yun, who teaches Jalga in New York, and I believe Yun Sifu's Jalga comes, uh, I think he's, I know they're under Jiao, the Jiao Bill lineage, but I think they're through Vietnam. Um, so the Jiao God looks a little different, and that's 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 fine. And uh, but I, you know, he said he, he told me, um, he said, man, he said I'm glad you did that. I'm glad you did the books, you know, and I'm, I'm glad you, you really got out there and pushed. He said because you know we need this, you know, and it's for anybody and everybody. So um, you, you just got to go forward. You just you just got to go forward, and, and it, you know the things people say they're going to sting and they're going to hurt. I mean that's just the reality. Um, but you know, and I tell people it's okay to to complain and you know vent for a while, but you can't do it all the time. Now, if you're going to complain and vent, let, let's I'm gonna let you go, and then we're gonna get some work done. But if you're gonna keep complaining and venting, we can't get anything done. That's wasted energy. So you can always put it right. for better use. Right, that's what I'm um, saying. Like, too many people complain, but they don't do anything about it. Um, and it's not trying to be mean. It's just uh, trying to say, like, you know, we're, uh, if you want to live, because for me, I'm trying to promote a life that we can live a better life. Like, I, because I, I listen to, um, like, Kung Fu could be anything. It's just not um, an aspect of um, martial arts. Because um, I read it in the uh, Bruce Lee philosophy. Um, was there any uh, struggle and fear when you uh, start learning uh, Kung Fu or Chaoga? Yeah, I mean, you know, not initially. Um, there, there is, there was, there's struggle. You don't, you don't see it at first, but later on, you, you see it. And you know, one, one of the things I, I, I always admired about my Sifu, um, uh, Dean Chen. Um, and Chin, Chin Yok Din is his proper name. Um, he was open, you know. He he was really open. He was he was, you know, a lot of ways like Bruce Lee, uh, you know, ahead of ahead of his ahead of his time, you know, ahead of the game. Um, but Sifu said, um, "This, you know, just because someone's Chinese doesn't mean they're good at kung fu. It just means they're Chinese." You know, he's like, you can be as good as someone Chinese if you want. All you have to do is practice. He said, all you have to do is practice. And his cousin, who's my, my uncle now, and, and as far as martial arts, uncle, uh, Kenny Chin, who I saw yesterday also. Uh, Kenny's proper name is uh, Chin Kwok Chi. Um, and he's actually a Charlie Foot man. Um, but he and Sifu grew up together in Hong Kong. They lived in the same building, two floors from each other, you know, on the Kowloon side. Um, he's actually was um, in Sifu's wedding, you know, when he moved over here and Sifu got, he got married at that time in the 70s. But um, he said the same thing. He said, it's all about putting in work. He says he has Chinese students that feel like because they're Chinese that they should be able to get this or that and this or that. He told him, no. He said, this guy's better than you, so I'm promoting him over you. What are you kidding? He's like, you know, because, and, and it's funny because now, now, in this country, I, I get it. Um, on in uh, Kung Fu Tai Chi magazine back in '97, on the problem of you know the race problem within the Chinese martial arts, but I, I there's a reason for it, and I get it, and it, it all stems back to the railroads in the 1800s, and you know the first generation Chinese that settled, most of them settled in California, San Francisco area you know, to work the railroads, the Trans-Pacific Railroad. And so, you know, you have these group of men that are being oppressed. Well, if you're oppressed, you know, why would I teach you as my oppressor, my art, so you can what, kill me? 
You know, that doesn't, you know, you had, I mean, they have documented, they have a, a, a documentation or articles written uh, in the newspapers of Chinese migrants, you know, uprising, you know, like, you know, fighting for, against, you know, cowboys, essentially, using these, you know, using these ancient techniques and stuff like that. Well, that was Kung Fu, obviously, you know, we don't know what system it was, but it was Kung Fu. Um, so again, so now you have, you know, Chinese, and you know, they're not really accepted here and they've been segregated by society. And so they live in these, they, they build their own community, which is Chinatowns, you know, as we know, as we know them now. Um, and they get to speak their own language, eat their own food, be around their own culture, you know, and they know that outside of that are a group of people that um, don't really accept them, don't really like them, don't really trust them. So why would you teach those people your art? You know, so I, so I, I totally get it. I get it. Unfortunately, a lot of that mindset, that old uh, mindset is still here because in Hong Kong, it's completely different. When I went to Hong Kong, when I went to China, both times in 04 as a member of the U.S. team and then 09 to compete. Because actually in 09 we went to visit and, and compete. They were just, they're just happy that the art is, that you're keeping their art form alive, that you're keeping a part of their culture alive. And that's the thing that a lot of Asian masters, and I'll say Chinese masters, because the Japanese and Korean uh, teachers really don't have, they have their own problems, but not to the degree that, we have in the Chinese martial art community with Chinese masters and non-Chinese uh, masters. Um, you know, we're, you know, believe me when I tell you, you have African-American, Latino-American, Caucasian-American, you know, they've been doing this stuff 10, 15, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You know, um, if we didn't have a reverence for it, we wouldn't do it. You know, I mean, yes, there's a language barrier and a lot of us now speak the language. You have a lot of a lot of teachers that speak Mandarin. You have you know some that speak uh, Cantonese. Like uh, matter of fact, uh, do you know uh, Chen Tai San, the late Chen Tai San? Mm. Chen Tai San was a Chole Fut teacher in New York. He taught Chole Fut and, and Lama Pai, and his Chole Fut is actually mixed with his with his Lama. He learned a lot of stuff. Um, Chen Tai San was basically a legend. Um, he actually used kung fu, hand to hand combat in World War II against the Japanese. Oh, wow, really? Yeah, I mean, Chen Tai-san was a legend. I didn't know a lot of this stuff about him until, ap until after he died. I knew he was had a rep, but I didn't know what. I mean, bare hand, like, using techniques and killing Japanese soldiers. That's he was crazy. Yeah, I know. So all his first-generation students, Steve Mature, Gus Campros, um, uh, David Ross, all speak Cantonese, all of them. Because really? At that time, when he came here, his thing was, listen, you know, in essence, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, listen, I'm too old to learn to speak English. You want to learn my art, you learn my language. So all of his first generation students all speak Cantonese. I just saw Steve Ventura at the Quotia tournament here in Maryland. And I asked him, I said, how much you, I said, you still speak? He said, yeah, I still speak. I said, so you speak, read, and write. He said, no, I can speak and read it. But his training brother, David Rawls, can speak, read, and write. Oh, wow. You know, one of my, um, one of my uh, seeings has a student named uh, Jeff Welsh who moved to Hong Kong to learn Zhao Ga. He learned here, moved to Hong Kong, been living there for about 20 years. You know, there's a Sifu over there now. This is a tall, this is, this is a six foot three white boy, skinny, blonde hair can now speak, read, and write Chinese. His Cantonese is so good, it's, it's, it's insane. And I've stood there in 09 when we, when we met, because I, you know, and he's from DC. So I stood with Jeff and they would just call him over to translate and he would go and speak. And I was like, oh my God. If you weren't looking at him, you'd swear he was Chinese, you know? Wait, uh, do you understand um, what he's saying? Like, do you learn like Mandarin or uh, Cantonese? Most of the candies I learned is, you know, the, the bulk of it is Kung Fu jargon. <laughs> you know? I mean, I can, I can say hi, I can say goodbye, I can say, you know, you know uh, hello, I can ask for a doctor, I can say I want to buy something or I don't want to buy something. That's about the extent of it. You know, I can say, I'm well, sorry, I can say, you're welcome, <laughs> you know, I can say, thank you, you know, you know, no, 
Yes, you know, stuff like that. I, I would like to learn more. I actually was learning uh, from uh, Raymond, Raymond Wong's mother uh, for, a few, for a little bit back in the 80s. So, because their family is from uh, Toysan, you know. Uh, and would you say that learning lang learning language is harder than uh, learning Kung Fu, or w w which is it? <laughs> yeah, learning learning the language is hard. Now, you know, and it's funny you make that that mention. You know, Tai Chi, you know, uh, Tai Chi Tuan or Tai Kikun is the only system of Chinese martial arts that has retained, you know, for a long time. Now the other systems are sort of catching up. They've retained all of the classical names of their movements, and they've been passed down. And the reason that is, is reason for that is, you know, we're talking about learning, learning a, a, another art form, which is, you know, you know, we're dealing with the Chinese culture. So, you have this physical element that's already hard enough to get, and then you add a language component. That 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 kind of turns a lot of people off. So, you know, they would say, okay. Um, like when I was learning, I didn't get all the proper names of the techniques. You know, I got the technique, but I didn't get all the proper names. I mean, I'm just, you know, some stuff I got, and some, and, but most of it I didn't. I started getting the proper name of techniques, one through reading various books, like Dr. Uh, Wong Dr. Uh, Wong Sifu's uh, book on Chole Fut. You know, we shared, like I said, we shared the same punches. So I got, okay, well, this is, we do the same punches. So this is Sao Choi, Pao Choi. Cup Choi Bill Choi. Okay, I got that from Dr. Wong's book. Okay, Ping Choi, reverse one. I got this from this book. So you start to, you know, pick up a little bit here and a little bit there. Um, and then, you know, you meet people and they tell you, oh, this is this, this is called this. You know, your training brothers get this, they share that with you. Like, oh, okay, now, now I know what this is. You know, we, you know, like, you know, we didn't get this technique as tiger catches a lamb. We got it as tiger claw, you know, or double tiger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we didn't, uh, we didn't, yeah. We didn't get, you know, we didn't, we didn't get, the, we didn't get those names. We didn't get, you know, you do a single tire claw going forward. You, you didn't get, you know, uh, you know, Fu uh, Chao uh, Dong, you know, single tiger exits the cave. We didn't get that. We got yeah, walk step forward tiger cast hands. That's what we got. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's true for a uh, um, foot system where they do the uh, tiger claw. We don't. We just say tiger claw. Oh, what is the um yell like? Why do we uh, yell in uh, kung fu? That's that's why I want to know. A lot of the southern systems yell um, for stimulation of certain organs. So I'll use the Honga system as an example. In the Honga system, a lot of the yells are to stimulate the heart, the lung, the kidney, liver, spleen the major organs of the body help bring energy to those organs. So when you look at a form like uh, Titsinkin, you know, Hong Kong, their last form, iron wire fist, where it's all dynamic tension, it's all hey gong. Um, and there's certain yells that correspond with certain maneuvers, and those maneuvers, those yells correspond to certain organs. Now with Chole Fut, um, a lot of the yells that we that you would hear, which is the same yells we do, you know, hey, wah, yeah, those yells, according to Chole Fut history, were old battlefield cries. Uh. And the, the premise was, if you were fighting in a large battle, so let's say, you know, remember during, during the, um, the turn of the last two centuries, from the 19th to the 20th, okay, um, you would have, like, you know, the Boxers' Rebellion was probably the, the, you know, the most famous. But let's say before that, when you were fighting, you know, during like the burning, after the burning of the Shaolin Temple, and you had all these societies, you had like the Heaven and Earth Society, you know, something, things like that. And so, but you had affiliate groups of those societies, like smaller societies. Well, if you're in a big fight with a lot of people, you know, if you heard someone like throw a punch and you heard, sick, you know, you, that might be someone that you're connected with. So you know there's, there's there's a friendly there's there's a there's an ally somewhere in here. So a lot of those were old battlefield cries to 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 let people know I'm with this group or I'm with that group, you know. Oh okay. Um, I would like to ask. I know this has nothing to do with the um, uh, Chao Ga a little bit. What is uh? You, have you watched the Birth of the Dragon? The 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 most most recent film with Phil Ng. Well, I don't know if what's it called, but um, it's with Bruce Lee, the new one. Have you watched it? Yeah, where where he's supposed to fight Wong Wong Jack Man. 
Yeah, how did you think about it? Because I just finished watching it. What, what did you think of it? I, I, I will be absolutely honest. Um, I actually sort of met Philip Ng a couple of years ago um, here, here in D.C., the Smithsonian Institute does a, a Made in Hong Kong Film Festival. So the year, two years after my book came out, my book came out, my first book came out in 2012. So in 2014, I went down to the Smithsonian Film Festival because I heard Phil, you know, Phil In was doing, um, they were screening Once Upon a Time in Shanghai. And I don't know, have you seen that film with Phil In? It's a really, it's a really, it's more, it's more modern. It's set in like early 1920s, you know, like prior, just prior to World War II. But it's a really good film, um, and he's he's the main star in that movie. So I went down to see it, but he was supposed to be also doing an interview, and so I said, oh, I get a chance to meet Philip Ng. I'll take him a copy of my book and autograph it and give it to him as a as a gift. And so when they did the interview, they did the interview Skype, and I was like, oh my god. <laughs> So that because he was in Hong Kong. And so I'm like, okay, now what do, what do I do? So um, long story short, I got I did get in the book, but I really liked that movie. Now, um with Birth of the Dragon, I, I, I just can't I can't do it. And it's no disrespect to Philip Ng. I, I think he's a really good actor. I think it's Charlie and Philip Ng, you know, does Charlie Fudd and Wing Chun. Oh, really? From his father. Uh -huh. Yeah. Phil Ng's from Chicago. Building from from here in the states in Chicago, uh, he moved to Hong Kong to do films. The, the Ng family, uh, Charlie Fuck, they've been there for years. So when you look at um, um, Once Upon a Time in Shanghai, he demos brilliantly. Goes from Charlie Fuck to Wing Chun, you know, and and, it, and it's believable. It's it's really you know it's practical the way they set it up. It's like okay, I can see that working, um, but. I, I, I couldn't bring myself to watch it. And I said it on Facebook. I just couldn't bring myself to watch it because if the story had been more accurate, I would I would have gone. I would have I would have gone to see it. You know, they they took creative license with the, with with an event that actually happened. And the problem is, there are people that are around that remember everything that happened. Even Linda Bruce's widow, Linda Lee Caldwell, remembers exactly what happened. <laughs> she said, "I was." Six months pregnant with Brandon, she said. You know the. You know he came. They, you know the, the. He came up. They had. A, they had a fight. He and one Jack man fought. He got him on the ground. They fought for about three minutes. He got him on the ground and said, "Do you give up?" And one Jack man said, "I give up." And that was it. He said, "But I was." And Linda was like, "I was right there." You know, I was pregnant with our son. I was standing right there and watching him fight. You know, so to take. A story that famous of the most hands down the most famous martial artist in the latter half of the 20th century and into the 21st century because nobody's more famous than Bruce nobody I mean we've got really good martial artists but I'm sorry you know and and you know uh, Bruce Lee sets the standard you know and, and I agree you know and I agree with um, uh, Sifu Carl Albright uh, who does uh, uh, Seven Star Prime Manus and Wing Chun, or, or in Hong Kong, excuse me. Um, if I was a Wing Chun practitioner, I would run that, I would ride that Bruce Lee gravy train to the bank. I would. You know, I get it. I'm, I'm not mad at anybody that does Wing Chun that's riding off Bruce. I get it. I totally get it. I would ride off of that, off the Ip Man series. I would do it. You know, I would do it. You know, especially if I'm making, you know, teaching for a living. You know, but I, I just couldn't bring myself to watch that movie. As much as I like Philip in because the story is not accurate. Even if they, they augmented it a little bit, I would say, okay, you know, I, I could I get it. But one of the things in the movie is, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you've seen it. Um there's a a because even Shannon, even Linda's, even Shannon, Bruce's daughter didn't like it. She hated it. She wouldn't see it. Because she's like, this is not accurate. You know, now you got the wife. Who's the widow who's still alive, and the daughter that's still alive. They don't like it because both of them know this is not what took place, you know. And and even the storyline doesn't jive. I mean, now if you go by the original incident of what happened, they fight 
Bruce Lee and Wong Jack Man, who was a Northern Shaolin style, styles under Ku Yu Chang, fight because Wong Jack Man and the, the powers to be at that time didn't like Bruce teaching non-Asians. So they wanted him to stop. He said no. And they said, well, you're going to have to fight, fight for it if you want to teach. And that's what happened. Now, in the movie, you have, if I'm remembering the trailer, you have this Caucasian kid learning from Bruce. So how they meet, he sees Bruce. I don't know. Did he see Bruce fight and they met? Or how did they meet? Um, uh, I, I watched it. It's what you talking about one giant man? No, the kid, the, uh, the, the white kid and Bruce Lee. They, they, they met. Because he was training with Bruce first, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was training with Bruce. He was a Bruce Lee student. Right. Okay. And so, then after, yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say you were right. There, um, there's some of the stuff that I seen in the um the new one. I didn't really vibe with because I you I watched a version of you heard of uh Dragon, uh yeah. it's a yeah, and I liked that one more because yeah. it was um uh the story because uh Linda, uh, Bruce Lee's wife provided all the details and it's um more accurate than this one. I I couldn't wrap my hand around with the new one. Yeah. So so now you have this new one where. You have this white guy who's learning from Bruce, and Bruce is teaching him. And then all of a sudden, he wants to learn from Wong Jack Man. Right, now, right, right. Yeah, right, okay. Now, if we go by what was told, what was the original crux of the matter with the fight, if Wong Jack Man had a problem with Bruce teaching non Asian students, why would he take a non Asian student? Yeah. You see what I mean? So the accuracy is off. It doesn't. It doesn't jive. So, so yeah, Dragon. And even though Dragon is, uh, um, you know, this, you know, creative license there also, like with the whole thing about, in, you know, how he injured his back, which wasn't in a fight. He pinched the nerve lifting weights. He didn't warm up properly, and he pinched the nerve in his back. And even Linda said, yeah, he pinched the nerve in his back. It wasn't. But I get it. For dramatic effect, you got to do this because having a fight and having a guy kick you in the back is much more dramatic than you lifting weights over your head and you go, oh, I hurt my back. <laughs> you know, you know, but that's what it was. You know, that's actually what how he hurt his back. But I get it. But the 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 taking of non Asian students. His first original student, uh, Jesse Glover, just died a few years ago. Matter of fact, he died about three years ago, almost three years ago. And, but he was Bruce's first student. And he's African American, and he and he died uh, uh, almost three years ago. He died in like early, early 2015, I believe, you know, and I was working on a project that I wanted to include him in. And just as I was, uh, I have a training brother uh, that teaches Jalga in Sacramento. And he was just about to put me in touch with a student of Jesse Glover. And Jesse was about to put me in touch with this guy. Jesse Glover died. I was like, oh, my God. I couldn't believe it. It hurts you, didn't it? Oh, that. Oh, my God. Uh, you know. Uh, but this is, I mean, because he was uh, starting to get out. You know, I, you know, he had been sort of a recluse. He was starting to get out more and, uh, and, 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 and teach what Bruce and Bruce taught him, stuff like that. He, he never stopped practicing. He never stopped training, from what I understand. And he had students, you know, but not a commercial school. You know, he ran sort of a, you know, come to my house type of thing, you know, I guess. Out of his garage, or out of his house, or out of his basement. But he was still teaching. He was actively teaching. Oh wow! Um, oh, thank you so much for that. What is your passion in life? Is it kung fu, or is there any other passion that you have? In I mean, my kids. Um, my fiance, who's a wonderful, you know, who's a godsend. <laughs> I tell you, she she is a godsend, and 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 just the best partner I could have, especially in what I do. When when she and I met. Uh, I told her, uh, she, we met through the gym and we fell in love and started this our dating, fell in love. But I told her, I'm broke with talent. <laughs> and, and it's funny because she looked me up and online, you know, and I, like I said, I'm just not new to getting online uh, with everybody. And the first date we went on, she says, you've done a lot of stuff. And I knew people had been written about, writing about me online. I, I had no website, no Facebook page, no nothing. So I knew everything that was out there, people were writing about me. Um, and I didn't follow because I was like, eh, you know, I, I got other things to do. 
Um, but she said, you've done a lot of stuff. And I said, yeah, I said, yeah, I've done, I've done pretty good for myself. And she says, no, you've done a lot of stuff. Because when she said she saw all of what I had done, she's like, oh my God, this guy's the real deal. He, he's a serious, serious martial artist. And I just had signed my contract with Tuttle Magazine, Tuttle Publishing for the first book. I just signed it. And she said, if he could do all this stuff by himself, no computer, no internet. I mean, I literally hand wrote my book on a legal pad. Really? Oh, wow. I literally hand wrote my book. The guy that assisted me in techniques, his name is Henry Shum. And Henry Shum is, uh, does uh, Chen Style Tai Chi with Stefan Berwick. Stefan Berwick is the senior student of Ren Guanyi. And Ren Guanyi is Chen Xia Wang's number one student. You know, and so Henry gave me a laptop. We were going to start printing it out. And he gave me an old laptop that he was going to donate to the library. And he said, Ron, you're more in need of a laptop than anybody I know. So he gives me the laptop. And I'm, I'm typing on the computer and typing on the laptop. It has no internet connection, but I can save stuff on it and put it on a thumb drive or whatever. And at one point, it crashed. And half the book was still on it. And my cousin, uh, who's, uh, who worked for computers for a living, I took it to his job. He got one of his colleagues to get all that information off and put it on the thumb drive. So I then spent the next, and I, I, I typed faster than I do uh, five, five, or, five or so years ago, but I literally went to the public library and typed every day for at least an hour to two hours a day to finish that book. Uh, how do you feel? Oh, sorry about it. Go ahead. No, no, that was it. Uh, how do you feel uh, um, being an author? Um. It's, it's, it's nice. I mean, it's, it's, you know, um, it's funny. I, I tell my fiance, I, you know, I always wanted to be known for doing martial arts. Now, I didn't know how known I wanted to be, but I wanted to like win a few championships, maybe win a title stuff, you know, maybe do some acting. I don't know. But, you know, I wanted to be known for doing martial arts and make my living doing martial arts and, and such, um, you know, competitive, because it's all I had, you know, and again, I'm just now getting caught up with the, the internet and the 21st century. But um, she saw that I did it. I basically did it the old fashioned way. Um, I built my reputation on a tournament circuit. I did forms. I did, I did it all. Forms, weapons, fight. I built my reputation up, you know, through the 80s, through an open tournament circuit. I did a little bit of full contact. It wasn't, and I loved it. I loved the full contact. But it wasn't organized like it is now. So I would... You know, you hear about an event and then it would get canceled because they didn't have enough competitors or the venue, they couldn't get the venue locked in. I'm like, oh, what? You know, doing all this training, what am I going to do? And so I did the continuous contact, but I was doing full contact and I was boxing at the same time. Oh, wow. Between 1991 and 1994, for four straight years, I trained pretty much six days a week anywhere between four to six hours a day. And that's all I did. Like, like for a normal, a normal teaching week for me back in the 90s was I go to the recreation center in my neighborhood, um, and it was a boxing team there. And I was teaching there, but I, I, you know, I asked the coach, could I work out with his, with his team? He said, yeah, no problem. So, I, so now I would box from five to seven, so that's two hours, then change teach Kung Fu, teach Yao Gao from seven to nine, right? I wasn't married at the time. Then go home, eat, you know, check on my mom, see how she's doing, and then work out again from like, let's say 11 o'clock until like 12.30. And while I was like, let's say doing, you know, crunches or ab work or whatever, doing the conditioning, throw in, you know, in VCRs, throw a tape in the VCR, and watch fight after fight after fight, boxing, kickboxing, Muay Thai, whatever I could get my hands on. My seeing, uh, his name is uh, Taran Breithaupt. He's been Breithaupt's been in the system since seventy three, since nineteen seventy three, and he would make me. And he was one of the senior fighting instructors in the school when I got there. When Sifu Chin was still living, and so Bright would make me videotape. He just make me these videotapes different fights just and I would just study and watch and I would watch not so much what the person did right 
but what the person did wrong. Because everything, everything happens for a reason. You know, people get knocked out for a reason. People get hit for a reason. Hands down, chin up, uh, didn't measure the distance right, you know, didn't cover this right. There's all kinds of reasons. So I did all that. Um, so, you know, I, I, it was all I had. My body and my knowledge and my skill was all I had. So I went out and I earned my reputation the hard way. You know, I went out and compete, you know. Um, so, and so um, as far as being an author, tacking on, then I started writing and got the writing bug with Kung Fu, you know, uh, Kung Fu Tai Chi magazine. Um, and then the book thing and videos and stuff. So um, it's, it's been nice to get out there and really represent the system. You know, um, I hope that people um, appreciate what I've been trying to do to represent the system. Because sometimes, I, you know, there's, there's, you know, um, there's times when I wonder if I'm even making a difference or if I'm making a dent. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, do you know, do you know um, Bobby Samuels, Robert Samuels? You know, you know Sam, Samuel Hong? Yes, yes, Samuel, okay, yes. so Samuel Hong uh, had, a, had a protege named Robert Samuels, African-American. I just saw him yesterday. But I met him formally a few years ago. And Bobby is, Bobby Samuels is the only African-American inducted into the Hong Kong Stuntman's Association. Only, really? Yeah, he's the only one. He worked for Samuel Hong for about 10 years. You know, lived in Hong Kong, speaks Cantonese. You know, really good guy. But I met him um, through, sort of through Vincent Lin, who also, you know, you know uh, the movie Operation Condor with Jackie Chan? Yeah. Um, yeah, he had yeah. yeah. Remember, the, remember the, the, he does a fight scene in a wind tunnel. Okay. Yeah. yeah. With, with, with the, the, with the, with the, with the um, where they were camping right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they, you know, you know he, he, the guy he's fighting with is Vincent Lin. So Vincent Lin is famous for that scene with Jackie. He's also done movies. So Vincent said, yo, you should talk to Bobby Samuels. On my 49th birthday, I didn't tell anybody. You know, my fiance went with me uh, here in Maryland. I went to the U.S. Capitol Classic tournament, Dennis Brown's tournament. And I've known Dennis for decades. Um, and so I saw Bobby. I knew what he looked like. And I walked up to him. You know, as far as like making a dent, you know, if I, again, I'm, sometimes I wonder. So I walk up to him and I said, you know, Bobby Samuels, I said, hey man, you know, Vincent Lim told me to come talk to you. And they know each other because they work together in Hong Kong. So he said, oh yeah, Vince, man, yeah, yeah how's he doing? Good. And he says, what's your name? And I told him my name. And he goes, he pauses, he goes, Ron Wheeler. He says, from the Jiao Ga? I said, yeah. He says, hey man, I've been wanting to meet you for years. I was like, you have? <laughs> You know, I couldn't believe it. He knew who I was. I was like, what? You know, and then I met uh, Bay Logan, um, who's who the producer, one of the producers for Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, one and two. He actually, um, you know, when when uh, Celestial brought all the Shaw Brothers films, the company Celestial. Mm. I'm not much on like I stopped like uh, watching all um like up to I'm not up to date as you are for martial arts because I do um uh, personal development um I read uh because my passion is not just uh uh kung fu mm. right and I read other uh what's it called like you know marketing business and stuff like that I mean okay. because yeah sorry um but well, yeah go ahead but if you look up if you Google Bay Logan he's he's gonna pop up so anyway Bay Logan has been doing, you know, what is a producer? He's been doing Hong Kong for like years. He speaks fluent Cantonese. He's from England originally. And so we met, I friended him on Facebook after my book came out. He didn't hit me back. I was like, oh, you know, no big deal. You know, I'm nobody who, you know, he gets hundreds of requests, I'm sure. A year after my book came out, years, he friend requested me. And I saw, I was like, who's this request from? And when I punched it, it said Bay Logan. So, of course, I accepted. And he ends up coming here. We get him to come here to do the Hong Kong Film Festival a year after I had seen Philip Ng. So, in 2015, we did the Smithsonian Festival. It was myself, Bay, uh, Bay Logan, Bobby Samuels, and Tari Cassell, who's a, also a legend in the game. Um, 
And so I talked to Bay Logan, you know, we finally, you know, we're Facebooking and I finally get a chance to talk to him because, you know, Hong Kong's like 12 hours ahead. And I finally get to talk to him. And I told him I wanted to send him a copy of my book. And he said, oh, I love an autographed copy. I actually bought it here in Hong Kong. And I'm like, how did my book get the, and I forgot. My book came out in the Asian market first before it hit the Europe market and then the American market. Really? Yeah. So that's the way Tuttle is set up. So when I talked to Bay Logan, here's an interesting fact. I said, how did you get my book? He said he was on the Kowloon side of Hong Kong. He went to a bookstore that Bruce Lee normally goes to when he was younger, when Bruce was alive. And he goes. And he sees the book. And he says, oh, a book on Zhao Ga. And he opens the book. And he says, oh, my God, there's a brother in the book. You know, and that's what he bought. So he found my book in the very same bookstore that Bruce Lee used to shop in. in oh, wow. I know, well, right? Uh, you know, throughout this whole talk, I realized you are having fun what you do, and you get to meet amazing people. And I was like, you seem so happy, and you light up. I was like, wow. You really do light up when you meet um, people that you uh, look up to or you enjoy, you know, like all the connection um, that you have, you know. And, um, yeah, I'm glad that you're enjoying it. Thank you yeah, for I'm sharing enjoying, that. I'm enjoying it. I wish I was making, I wish I was making a little more money, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was, you know, I mean, you know, I, I, I tried the commercial school route. I tried to, like, build students and, and then get enough student body where I could go into a building. It, it, it didn't work. You know, I mean, but, you know, I, I, I tell people my, my um, dedication or, uh, to the system is not predicated upon, you know, you being here. Meaning, if you want to learn from me, come on and learn. No problem. But if you're not here, I'm still going to keep going. <laughs> you know, so, you know, you could be here and not be here. Now, financially, that doesn't do well for my pocket, but, you know, it is what it is. But I could sleep good at night, you know. I mean, I, you know, we've all had um, issues from time to time. But I can honestly say, when it comes to martial arts, I got a clean conscience. I sleep good at night. I sleep good because I've never talked, you know. If I got a problem with somebody, you know, I'll just go to them and hash it out, you know, and stuff like that. But I've never talked about anybody, belittled anybody, talking negative, you know. If I got a problem with people, you know, I'll go to you and we can we can talk it out and, and hash it out and stuff. Or if we can't hash it out, you say, you know what? Okay, you know, I hear you. Um, I'll stay on my side of the fence and you stay on your side of the fence. And and right. never shall I pass cross again. But for the most part, you know, I sleep good. I don't have a problem. And, and now, you know, when I was younger and competing, you know, I was very serious. And it was all about the competing. You know, got to, you know, got to win, got to win, got to win. Um and sometimes, most times I won, sometimes I didn't, but most times I won. Uh, and then as I got older, by the time I hit my 30s, you know, I, you know, I, I, I guess I was sort of coming into my own at that point as a martial artist or as a person, you know. And I was much more comfortable. So when I had a team, I had a small team, and we went out from 97 until 2003, and we would go to tournaments. And I remember the first tournament we went to, which was the Great Lakes Kung Fu Championship in Cleveland, Ohio. It was uh, April of 2000, April 97. And I remember we got there and, you know, everybody's in a uniform and we're registering, everybody's in a uniform. And we had, you know, our uniforms custom made. We had, you know, and um, they said, they were like, oh, should we change? Should we change? And I'm like, sit down, relax, you know, go smoke a cigarette or something. Go get a beer, sit down, relax, <laughs> take it easy. You know, and they'll say, everybody's getting dressed. Will you sit down, man, calm down. Getting worked up for nothing, just take it easy. Jesus Christ, oh my God. You know, and then, you know, people will be warming up and stuff. And, you know, I'm like, okay, go put your pants on and leave. You know, you know, you know, and, but see, I know how turns work. You want to look nice when you do your uniforms. Don't sweat your uniform out. And I'll tell them, just go put your pants on. And, Leave that T-shirt on and come on back, man. And then I say, okay, now put your jacket on. Now put your sash on. Okay, now go. You know, and it was the same in, in China. When I went to China the first time, um, me being in competition, and this, you know, I knew how tournaments were in China, even though it was my first time. 
And I remember it's the only tournament I can actually say um, I'm, I've never competed that early in my life, <laughs> ever. We had to be at the site at 7 a.m. Uh, 7 a.m. Was, uh, what was your tournament like for like uh, below? Uh, you said that was the earliest. What's the latest for you for the tournament? Oh, latest? Oh, my God. I mean, I'm, you know, uh, the, the one drawback to Chinese tournaments a lot of times, especially now, they're notoriously late. They run late. Oh. You know, they do, you know, just, just, you know, take a take a lesson from NASCAR. Take a lesson from the open tournament circuit. Just win your tournament. Don't worry about master's demonstration, lion dance all the time. You know, some not every tournament has to have a lion dance. <laughs> you know, not every tournament has to have a master's demo. Stop. Just let's let's go. Let's go. Um, I, matter of fact, I'll give you my best and worst experience because I competed this year, and I took students to compete. So within a week of each other, July twenty eighth, August fifth this year. Okay. July, we go to the Quotia Federation Tournament, Towson County, Maryland. We get there. I take my two students. We get there at 9 o'clock in the morning. Oh, 9 o'clock. We read, I get them registered. I'm not going to compete. I'm going to coach. We get them registered. It costs like $135 for them to register to compete. They're both going to do forms and fighting. We wait. They do the opening ceremony. Tournament starts. About 10.30. Do the opening ceremony, a couple of demos. Okay, okay. Let, 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 let's move along. Let's move along. So they didn't do their first event. They only had to do two events. They didn't do their first event until quarter of seven in the evening. We've been there since nine o'clock in the morning. They didn't even get a chance to fight. They did not get a chance to fight. And so and they were crazy. Tired. Right. And they were tired. And they looked at me and they said, see, can we can we fight in the Capitol Classic? I said, yeah, go fight in the Classic. Because it's basically the same thing. Very next week, okay, August 5th, in Maryland, again, now we're in PG County with the National Harbor, Dennis Brown's tournament. Okay. I go reg I go register myself that Friday. I got there, the National Harbor Friday. I get through training, teaching my class. I go register. I got there at, at 1 o'clock. I register. I'm doing three, two events. I'm just going to do two events. I'm, I made the finals four years in a row. I'm the only job guard person in the, uh, to make the finals four years in a row. And I'm the oldest to make it four years in a row. But anyway, um, so I register. And then I go in to the tournament site to the floor, to the convention floor, talk to Dennis Brown, talk to them. It's, it's quarter of two in the afternoon. They've got 10 rings running already, 10, and they're full. All the kids, I mean, musical form, synchronized form. I'm like, what in the world? So I you know, took my phone out and videotaped and posted up on Facebook. We go the next day, Saturday. Now we all got to compete. They got to register, so on and so forth. We go we get their base at the same time, quarter of nine. They kick everybody out of the hall. They reopen the doors at five after nine. We go in. They start run, They start the first division, 930. We start competing because it's myself and two students. We started competing at 1130. If I had made the finals, and they, they placed, by the way. So one student is in the beginner. He got first and third. He got first and forms, third and sparring. My other student uh, gets first and weapons, first and sparring and second and forms, and I get two firsts. Now, if I hadn't got two firsts, which would which put me in the finals, let's say if I got two seconds. Now, I, I told you, we started competing at 11.30, we would have been done by one o'clock. Oh, wow. Walking out the door. Yes. I made the wow. finals. I made the finals for forms and weapons, grand champion. I'm doing traditional against contemporary wushu, which I know which way this is gonna go. <laughs> But you know, I'm representing. You know, I gotta represent. Right. Even though I made, um, I do have. Sorry, sorry go ahead. No, I was gonna say to finish out. No. I made the finals. We finished. I didn't win. Okay, no problem. We're walking out the door at four thirty. Four thirty. Four thirty. But you do love tournaments, right? Or oh, I, oh, oh yeah, I love. I love them absolutely. 
long term. Because you know, where where are you going to get a chance to test your skill? You know, mm. you could be a big fish in a little pond and stay in the school and spite you know and beat everybody in the school. And people say, oh, you know, he's such a good fighter, such a good fighter. Go out there and compete. Go out there and go against someone you don't know. And again, we're talking about in a semi-controlled environment because even though you have referees and judges, things can go wrong. People still get knocked out. You know, people still get jaws broken. It, it happens. You know, I mean, somebody's kicking you in the face. I mean, <laughs> it's going to hurt. You know, so the ref can't stop and kick you in the face. That's up to you. You know, but if you want to test your skill, go compete. Don't don't tell me how good you are. Go compete. You know. Now, if if tournaments are not for you. That's fine too, because some people don't get into this art for tournaments. They don't get into it. You know, it's more of a, you know, a cultural development internally, and I totally get that and totally respect. Some of the best teachers I know don't compete, have never competed, and they're, they're and they're guys that I would not mess with. You know, I wouldn't. You know, you know the phrase. I, I wouldn't go near them in a dark alley. I wouldn't mess with them on a on a light on the on the clearest sunniest day of the summer. I'm like, I'm not, I don't want that problem. <laughs> you know. Um, um, before when we did this, um, not before, um, there was during the talk you said training. Can you give us tips uh, how to do training a little bit better? What we can do, like shadow boxing forms, and how can we, um, uh, like, do you ever get bored also when you train? Or? No, no, because you can, you know, I know we use, I know we use the phrase master a lot, you know, but in reality, you know, what have you mastered? You, you can't master it. You can't. You, you, there's, there's no such thing as mastery. There's basics performed at a high level. A punch is a punch, a kick is a kick. The only difference is time and experience. And that's why we say experience is the greatest teacher. The more time you put in, the more experience you have, the better you're going to be. You know, okay. and that's what it is. And I, I'll, I'll quote uh, the actor Chen Kuan Tai. Uh, from one of the old Shaw Brothers movies, uh, Challenge of the Masters. And he tells his, uh, uh, Gordon Liu, he says, when you first start learning Kung Fu, he says, after two years, you start to think, I'm pretty good. He said, but then after 20 years, you realize I'm not that good. So you just keep training to be good. Right. And also, to what, like, I think that do we, uh, I feel like some sometimes students get caught up with the sash. Because I kind of listen to Bruce Lee where, you know, uh, or Brendan Lee or whatever they say, like, it's only good for a hold of um, your pants. I know it's going to offend a lot of people, but what do you think about that? Well, that's, I mean, traditionally, Chinese martial arts was like every other art. It didn't, there was no sash or belt ranking. The, the, what we know um, as, you know, sash ranking or belt ranking, and I'll start with belt, okay? <coughs> excuse me, came from Hiro Akano, the founder of Judo. And he believed, now, now he was smart. He was smart because he realized that, that people are inherently dumb and they need something tangible to see and touch in order to grade where they are. Uh, so that's why he came up with the belt, an actual belt rank system. So you go from white belt to you know yellow belt and so on and so forth to black. But... Though to get to those levels still took from white belt to black belt anywhere from 10 to 15 years in a minimum. You know, so people were willing to dedicate. Now it's a business. And so that's why you see, you know, in Taekwondo, you know, uh, you know, they make more money than anybody. <laughs> you, know, you know, they do. And, and they got the kid, they got the kid niche locked up. I mean, they've got, they figured it out. But, um, you know, it used to be you get a white belt. And then you get a yellow belt. Now you see, you know, I've heard people say, "Yeah, my son's a a, a third degree, a third degree white belt." I'm like, I'm, what? what you, a third degree? What? What? What's that? Well, he's got, you know, he's third. This, and I told him, "There's no such thing." No, in this school, what? Or, or third degree yellow belt? I've heard it all. And what it is is, it's a way to make more money. It's a revenue stream. But they know. Now they're still going to teach the material. But they know that people need to feel and touch something. You just tell them you're getting better. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that. I need to feel it. I need to see it. I need to wear it. 
you know, so I can have something to show. That's what it is. You know, I thought the, the, the you know, so the, the sash ranking system, you know, that Kung Fu has adopted from the belt rank system, I get it. I, I totally get it and understand it. And now, as long as you're not um, teaching garbage, and a lot of people have cut their curriculum also. You know, back in the old days, you had to learn almost everything, you know, to, to be an instructor, to be a Sifu. Now people limit what you have to learn. So they'll say, well, I'll, I'll use my system as an example. So they'll say, okay, from to get to Black Sash, you know, Black Belt, you have to learn these, um, these six forms to get to Black Sash. And then everything else is extra if you want it. So, then, so they'll say something like, you know, let's say you have to learn uh, punching as far as for like beginner level. You have to learn uh, the punching form, the stepping form, small tiger. Okay, that's beginner level. Okay, intermediate, you have to learn uh, double headed staff, uh, flower fist, and spear. Okay, that's intermediate. Advanced, uh, you have to learn big tiger. And broadsword. Okay. Now you gotta test all those to get your black sash. You test how do you guys sorry, go ahead. I was gonna ask you how do you guys do the testing? Because uh, I remember Hong Fu, they um when we uh, they call it first form, they test it for uh um timing. You guys do that and the second one, uh, I remember when I was testing for uh to get on the staff it was for uh, just they put me on a horse stance really low and they put me on the uh broadsword you guys do any type of that like that yeah we don't test for time um but again that's you know um but that's a more modern thing because everybody's you know uh speed is gonna be different you know especially when you're just starting out you know and depending on the length of your limbs how tall you are how short you are everybody's speed is gonna be different you know um, that's not to say that someone heavy can't move fast or that someone's little is going to move, you know, slow or someone little is going to move fast. I've seen people who are small that can't move that fast. I've seen big people who move quick, you know. Um, so that's that to me is not a great marker. I, I get it, though. I mean, that, that, that's the way it's set up, you know. Right, yeah, that's how, yeah, right. Go ahead. So I'm not going to criticize it. That, that's, you know, how you set your school up is how you set your school up. Um, right, how is the way that uh, you guys test? The way we used to test in the old days when I was coming up, you had to test for every single form and then level. So, so many forms per level. But you to get to advance, to get down to the instructor level, you were going to be in the school at least a good seven years, oh, wow. seven, eight years, easy. You know, and then to get to sequel level, you had to do everything, every single form, every single weapon, every two man set, and spar, and, and, and do line dance. You had to do it all. You know, and people, you know, would fail you. They had no, see, you can't, you can't do that these days and run a commercial school. People are paying 150 bucks a month. They're buying the uniform. They're buying the equipment, the sparring gear, the bag, the patch, the t-shirt. The weapons. You know, yeah, weapons. People are showing out, you know, you know, a couple of grand a, a year for little, for little Timmy to learn. Well, guess what? If you're running a commercial school and that's how you make your living, you're not failing, Timmy. You're going to make sure Timmy passes. You're going to do everything in your power to make sure Timmy passes. Because you know what happens if Timmy doesn't pass? Timmy's parents pull Timmy out of your school. And that and that revenue stops. You know? Um, and, you know, so, you know, but see, for back in the day, there was a guy, I remember, uh, my, my singing told me, uh, Brian, he told me the guy was testing for small tiger. He did the form perfect. Did it perfect. No problem. Sifu said, okay, show me, give me five applications. Meaning five techniques. Show me the techniques, how, how the forms applied. And the guy couldn't do it. And Sifu said, wait a second, hold it. You know, you did the form right. Now just show me an application. You know, because they, they, what they would do is they give you a partner. So like when I tested, I tested for small tiger. You do the form. First they check, check your, your stance. You're going to sit in the stands for at least three minutes. Could be longer, but at least three. You know, so you're sitting your horse, basic forms, basic punches, basic kicks, stuff like that. Then do the form. Then application. So they give you a partner and say, okay, you know, they'll, they'll say, okay, tell them what you wanted to do. 
and apply the technique and tell us how, to, how you're going to do it, how it's applied. So you say, okay, um, I'll, I'll just say, you know, like, we, one of my training brothers named Chris, I'll just use him as an example. I would say, Chris, um, give me, now you gotta remember, you got to, it's up to you to make you look good. So you got to know what you're doing. So you say, I would say, like, Chris, give me a, a left foot, left foot forward fighting stance. He gets a fight stance, left foot forward. So I'll say, give me a left punch. And he punches. So I block and then I might grab and then pull and punch, you know, something like that. And then I have to explain it, you know, and he says, he's giving me a left punch. I'm going to use the hook. In, that, in, that, in those days, we say, you know, the hooking block, because I didn't have the name, <laughs> the name of the technique. Hooking block, then I'm going to grab his hand and pull and punch, which is I'm taking it from this point, and I'm using this, this part here, and then the pull at the end of it and the punch. And they'll be like, okay. And then they grade you. You know, and then they might say, give me another tech, give me another application using the same technique from the other from another punch, like a hook punch. I said, okay. So, you know, they'll they'll tell you, you know, but this one guy, he just couldn't get the techniques. So Sifu failed him. He said, you know the form, but you can't apply it. I, I can't pass you. I'm sorry. You gotta take it, take your test again. The guy left the school. Oh. Okay. <laughs> you know, oh wow. It doesn't happen these days. You, you, you know, people can't fail. My fiance is, is very quick to tell you, you know, I don't give compliments easy. You know, now I'm not, I don't, I don't crap on people, but you know, when people like, not do a lot of personal training and boxing and kickboxing, um, you know, and I only have a few, I have four students that I teach y'all got to only four right now. Um, and I tell them, I'm like, I'm not running a commercial school. I'm not going to move you on until I'm satisfied that you're doing this right. So if you can handle that, you can come learn with me. If not, I'm like, there's a lovely karate school around the corner, go there. I'm like, I'm not gonna do it because you're representing the system and I need the system to be done properly because it's not only my reputation, it's all my instructors and my Sifu and, you know, Everybody else that has come before us to represent Jiao Ga. I want the system to work. I want them to say, you know, I learned Jiao Ga from around with, oh, okay, okay. You know, I know, I know your, your stuff should be tight. So I'm like, you're going to get out, you know, and again, I don't make them compete. I'm like, I don't see if I'm thinking about competing. Are you sure about that? <laughs> you know, I'm like, because if you think I'm a pain now, I'm going to be more of a pain if you get ready for a tournament. You know, and at the, they're all at the stage where I just go, the only phrase comes out of my mouth is they look good, and I say, Oh, yeah, now you're getting it. I was like, Oh, okay, now now you look now you look like a jog on man. I was like, and I told him, you know, and I'm you know, I poke fun with him. I said, I don't know what that stuff you were doing before was a little white crane, whatever that stuff is, <laughs> you know, you know, but they, and they always hear and then they hear this, do it again, do it again, do it again, do it, start over, do it again, start over, do it again, more power, more speed, do it again, do it again. I mean they're bending over, huffing and puffing, I like stand up and breathe. Stand up and breathe. You want to learn Kung Fu? Now, now, now the, tr the real training begins. Do it again. Sit, sit in our horse stance. Don't move. You know, lock that leg. You know, I'm old school. I'll stand on their legs, bounce, bounce up and down on their legs. You know, I'm like, you know, do iron body training. You know, hold, hold that stance. Punch them in the body, body conditioning. I'm like, what do you think is going to happen? You get in the fight. You think the mic going to hit you? You got to be ready. You know, and so, Scott, one of my students, Scott, when he when we went to the Calvin Classic, and I was running my weapons division at the same time, so I didn't get a chance to see him fight. And after I finished, I was like, he hasn't come back. Let me let me go over to the ring and see what's going on. And he's walking toward me. And I said, this, this, this is his first, this is the second tournament but his first time fighting. And he was doing intermediate, because I was like, there's no way you're going beginner. You're way, way too good for a beginner do intermediate. So he was going to get, you know, um, blue belts and, you know, green and blue belts and stuff. And sees you know, guys on, you know, point karate teams and such. And he comes walking toward me. And I said, so what happened? He said, I won. I said, you won what? He said, I won the division. You did? I mean, five-foot trophy. He, he walks away. His second turn, he walks away with two five-foot trophies. Do you know how long it took me to get a five-footer? <laughs> <laughs> how long did it take you to take? I didn't get, I didn't get my five-footer until... Of uh, of uh, 
I think it's oh, wow. 14 and then it's all tournament, you know. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, but, it, you know, I, I do. I, I enjoy myself. I, I really do. Because I'm not yeah. trying to, you know, it, I, I have met along the way, I've met some, some teachers um, that were, you know, jerks. I met some teachers that were jerks. People, one teacher, um, he's passed away. I don't want to mention his name because I, I still admire the guy because his, his Kofu was really good. Um, and uh, he came here and I wanted to, I, I, I wanted to I address him and stuff. And he kind of like, and turned, like walked away from me. I was like, oh, he's a jerk. <laughs> you know? And I bowed, I said, you know, and I've met a couple others like that, you know? And I said, uh, I said to myself, if you ever get to that level, treat everybody with respect, even especially beginners, because beginners are very impressionable. You know, they're coming into the art; they're trying to learn. You know, and if you if you talk to them like now, they, they and they know their place; they know they're beginners, and they know who you are. That's why they're coming up and giving you compliments or whatever. Um, but if you talk to them like, yeah, yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah I appreciate it. You know that. that you know, one, you just left a bad, give them a bad impression. You know, whatever positive view they had of you is completely gone now. You know, so why do that? If some beginner comes up and says to me, you know, oh, see, for real, I really like, hey, man, thank you. You know, I mean, it's, you know, that's nice. They're taking the time out to, to say thank you for whatever you've done to contribute. And they admire what you do. And they want to follow in some, some way, shape, or form your footsteps. You know, maybe not exactly, but, you know, promoting their art, they may want to be a good tournament competitor or be a writer or do articles or, or do be a researcher, you know, you know, whatever, you know, or however long they can decide to stay with the art. But to give them a negative impression because you think you're up here and they're down there, I mean, that, that's just wrong. And so I never wanted to do that. So I'm, I'm exceedingly comfortable with myself, um, especially as I get older. I mean, I, I like the rank of... Sifu, I I I, I um, appreciate it, um, but I don't think I'm up here. You know, I'm still learning, I'm still practicing, I'm still training, I'm still working. You know, and you know, while I have a few students, you know, when I didn't have any students, I was I was still I was still doing, I was still out there hustling. So it didn't matter to me. But it, I tell people, but if you come to me, you know, this is what it is. This is how you're getting trained. Now, if you can deal with that, you're good to go. I got you covered. But if you can't, you know, I hear you. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not for everybody. You know, I'm not everybody's cup of tea. You know, um, you know, I, I try not to be a pain in the ass. But you know, but if if I'm training you and you're not practicing properly, you know, I'm going to be upset. And you know, I, when I was doing personal training just in fitness, um, I would matter of fact. I did it. I did it twice. I've done it twice. Once as a trainer, once as an instructor. But I had student, you know, people that I was training that they felt like I wasn't giving them what they wanted, or they were, you know, having it. And I gave them their money back and said bye. Really? Yeah. You know, I'm like, you know, you, you're asking me to train you. You haven't bought me. <laughs> You know, I'm not a commodity to be bought. You're asking me, you're asking for lessons, you know. And so, um, but if you get an attitude with me, you know, I, I got to drop you as a client or a student. I'm, I'm not going to have it. I, you know, I'm too old for that, man. You know, I, I really am. It's not a, you know, if I'm treating you with respect, you know, you should give me respect. But if you think that that you paying me gives you the right to, uh, uh, belittle me in some fashion or expect something from me because you're paying me a certain amount of money. I'm like, that ain't happening. So sorry, but you know, it is what it is, you know? And but I, yeah, I've done, it, I've done it twice. Matter of fact, I take that back. I've done it three times. Three times. And I'm like, not worth it. Not worth the headache. And you know, have a nice day. Good luck in life. See you later. And thank you so much for being so humble, you know? 
a lot of people like when they get up there they're not really that humble um because i get um uh but oh yeah i forgot to say thank you so much for doing this interview i'm very grateful to you you know why well, thank you thank you for asking thank you for asking thank you and uh, i have this it's like you said like you I, I hear what you're saying that you like respect you know and i had this um i i don't want to mention name but i had this author that i read the book and i wanted to promote just like your a book i want to promote and i believe the message but the, and I asked for like an interview and, you know, the person said, it's busy. I understand that. But if I really believe in what you do, I'm going to persist. Right. So I asked what, what, what happened is the person blocked me and I said, Whoa, that's not okay. You're, you're a public figure, you're a CEO, your best selling author. Why would you do that? You know? And I'm um, thank you. Uh, grateful for you for like, like that. You no, know? no. I mean, thank you for, thank you for asking. You know, like I said, like I said, sometimes you know when when I saw when I saw your uh, your message, and I was like, I was like, wow, someone actually wants to interview me. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just funny to me because you know, in all my book, I was like, holy crap, someone picked it up. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I you know, like I said, so I'm you know I'm appreciative, but you know, it, you know, you know, people, it, you know, I don't I don't know. I mean, you know. It's amazing that, you know, in this day and age, you know, everybody thinks, you know, like I said, you know, like we both said, they think they're up here. I'm like, you know, just just treat people, you know, it's the old saying, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you want to treat you with respect, treat them with respect first. Now, if, you, if you're if you given respect and none come back, you know, if you want to try to give it a couple more times and, and none come back, then you have to kind of make a decision. Do I want to keep trying to, Give this person respect. Um, sometimes the respect is is is, is phony though, um, and I mean, what I mean by that is when I just you know before we end this real quick, as I was writing the book. Now I went through a, a really turbulent time in my life. My mother just died. I just got divorced. You know, lost my family home, and I still kept writing this book. I, I swear to God, I swear to God. Every single woman I dated at that time was like oh i believe in you i, I want to back you i want to help you I'm like okay and it never happened it never happened and it, it's, it's like wait a minute what happened to the believing in me and, and you know show me some support here you know and they're like what you know i mean the words i remember one time i had a I, you know i had to meet with my photographer for the first book to go over some stuff we were finishing it out and I, the woman I was dating at the time, and I told her three weeks out, I told her two weeks out, I told her the week of. And the day before, she wanted to know if I was coming over for dinner. And I was like, what is wrong with you? I was like, I told you I got to meet with my photographer. His name is Moshe Zussman. So shout out to Moshe Zussman Photography. Great photographer. So any of you guys looking to do a martial art book, he is your guy. Now, he's here in D.C., but he is your guy. And it's Moshe Zussman Studios photography studio. But I had a meeting with Moshe and told the, the woman I was dating with, you know, and you know, I'm in my forties and I'm like, so this, I'm like, you should understand this. And she was in sales and marketing. That's what she did for a living. <laughs> and she got upset with me because I couldn't come and have dinner with her. And I went, what are you talking about? I told you, you know, I've been telling you all week, I've got a meeting with, with Moshe. Well, what? Well, can't you change it? No. And I was like, I'll see you in a couple of days. <laughs> you, know, you know, people will get in your way. But I tell you, I swear to you, every, I dated about, you know, a couple of women, you know, after I got divorced. After my book came out, I'm not making this up. After my book came out, this is the phony. So you have genuine uh, showing up and, and concern and like and the phony. This is the phoniness. After my book came out in the summer of 2012, 2012. Um, the five women I had dated and three that I had never dated all hit me up on Facebook. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. All hit me up. Someone, oh, I see you got your book. Oh, we should get together and hang out. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making it up, man. I'm, I'm not making it up. Oh, wow. That's crazy. Yeah. 
Um, thank you for so much for that. Um, before we let you go, sure. I will ask two more questions before we let you go. What is your, uh, what does success look like to you? Um, you know, well, you know, I don't know. I don't, you seem, I, I'm looking at some of the anime, uh, anime behind you. Uh, I don't know if you're, are you, are you a Star Trek fan? Um, no, well, my, my friend is, I, I watched the new version. You are? And you're yeah. a Star, uh, oh, yeah. Star Trek? I grew up, remember, I grew up on, remember, I was born in 65, so I watched the original and then Next Generation, and, you know, and I'm also a massive Star Wars fan, and I see you got Vegeta, Goku, Trunks back there, you know, I, I, I'm on it, I'm on it, believe me, you know. Um, is that Bulma? You got Bulma back there? Let's like Bulma back there. No, no, that's not Bulma. Um, I just, um, no, I got Naruto, uh, you know, uh, One Piece, um, what's his, um, what's his name? Um, Krillin. 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 That's okay. That's right. I would say so. But anyway, um, you know, but until you know, Star Trek universe, you know, money is no longer an, an issue. You know, everybody is working for the betterment of humanity. Well, until we reach that point, we all need money to survive. So, um, happiness basically making you know, you know, being able to you know, just treat people right, do good. We're all gonna make mistakes. You learn from your mistakes and move on. Your, your pros outweigh your cons, because again, we're all gonna make mistakes. Um, little mistakes, you know, big mistakes and everything in between. But just treat people right, man, and, and you know, make enough money to take care of your family, maybe pass down something to your kids and stuff like that. And you can, you know, when you're on your deathbed, you can look back in life and say, man, you know, I, I, I think I did okay. I think I did okay. Because we're all gonna hit the dirt, you know, that, that's, right, just, right. That, that's just a definite. Right, right. Um, but that's what it is. You know, you don't have to treat, you don't have to step on people in order to get ahead. You, you really don't. You don't. And I've, I've seen it, I've seen it in, in, in my system. You know, people trying to step on somebody just to get to one up somebody. I'm like, what for? You know, it's happened to me, but I'm like, okay. You know, you want to, you want to say this about me online? Yeah, that, that's on you. You know, because again, it's wasted energy. Let me, let me get out there and promote. Let me get out there and do, you know, let me get out there and hustle, you know, let let the general let those that are in your circle or around see you know make let them make the decisions. So. Okay, so you're more basically around like um, living your passion and, and pa maybe passing it down, right? That's what you're saying for success, right? Sure, but I'll, you know yeah, what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna use a Star Trek, a line from uh, Star Trek, First Contact, where in the, in Star Trek, Lord Zephram Cochran is the person who discovered warp drive. And so if in the movie First Contact, they have to go back in, in, in the past, Earth's past, and stop the Borg from stopping the first warp drive. And so Riker is in the ship with Cochran, and he tells him, you know, Cochran tells him what his philosophy is on life. And Riker says, you know, you know, someone once said, don't try to be a great man, just be a man, and let history make his own judgment. And Cochran goes, that's rhetorical nonsense. And he says, who said that? He says, you did, 10 years from now. <laughs> you know, but that's what it is. Don't try to be, don't try to be great. Just, just be you. Just, just be you. You, you. you can only be you. You know, like Snoop Dogg, Snoop, they said Snoop, Snoop says they wanted him to rap a certain way, like the new artists, you know, rap like Drake. He said, that ain't me. He said, I can't rap like that. that. That's them guys. He said, you can't be nothing but you. You can only be you. Do what you do best. Do you. And if you're doing right, let other people make their decisions. But as long as you know you're doing right, you can sleep good. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Where can we find you online? It's, yeah, go ahead. I'm on, I'm on Facebook. Uh, so I get, I get quite a few friend requests. Um, I don't acknowledge all of them. Because I don't, I just don't know a lot of people. I'm not, you know, again, I'm 52, you know, I'm not 32 or 22. So I'm not a millennial. So I'm not into collecting friends, collecting friends, collecting friends, you know. Um, you know, and I can tell you honestly, you're only going to have about uh, five real friends in your life, in your entire life that you, that you can call friends. I mean, people that would take a bullet for you, five. If you get to six, you got one friend too many, get rid of one. Um, <laughs> But so I don't I don't acknowledge a lot of friend requests because I just don't 
you know, I just, you know, uh, you know, I can't communicate with everybody. You know, there's certain teachers that I've come up with through the tournament circuit. We're now teachers, so I know them. So I've got, you know, I'm with them, and we, you know, or or I've heard of this teacher, you know, so I know this teacher through this person, stuff like that. So, uh, but I'm on Facebook. Um, if you anybody also got the fan page, right? I got Sorry, yeah, right. I, yeah, I got the uh, the the other Facebook page. I got my private. I got my 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 more uh, uh, business page, which I need to really get more in line with. But um, if people wanted to, you know, look me up for seminars and workshops, um, the best way to catch me is um, through my email, and I'll throw it out there. Is Ron dot it's all lowercase. Uh, Ron dot Wheeler W H E E L E R one just the number one at yahoo.com or you can friend request me on Facebook and send me a private message that way. So okay, I don't do thank I'm you. not on Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to do this you. interview. Um, I hope that you have an amazing year um, coming this year because uh, keep warm. I know it's cold, um, and that's pretty much. Uh, thank you for watching, guys, and I'll see you next time.